Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, the MS Pierce. It's Ukraine War News Update, first part thereof, for Saturday the 26th of August 2023. Uh, I will not be able to do my second part to this until later today. I'm up early because my one of my boys has a football match. It's starting already. It's that part of the year. Football and rugby means that Saturday mornings my schedule will be somewhat different. I used to have a job until fairly recently to have me working Saturday morning. Uh, and now I could also do these videos on on the side. Um, but I sort of quit that so that I could watch my child sort of grow up or one of my, both my twins uh, grow up and play sports and whatnot. So uh, that means going forward, Saturday mornings might be a bit funky. It just depends. Anyway, here's the first part. Uh, you don't need to know all that, but you do now. So uh, there you go. Uh, right, Russian losses for the day before, as according to the Ukrainian general staff, all the usual caveat supply. I still haven't done that disclaimer sheet. I will do that this weekend, I, I promise. No, I don't. Uh, right, 640 personnel is uh, an uptick of about a couple of hundred. And that, again, is not about what these exact numbers are for me. Uh, as I keep telling you, this is about trends, about working out what happened the day before, where where this thing is going, et cetera, et cetera. So 640 personnel means that I think you've got some active front lines that are pretty tasty. Uh, and by tasty, I mean taste horrible because people are dying. Uh, that That is particularly around the Robotna area, I think it's probably translating into this. Um, 12 tanks is a significant uptick and 18 APVs, armor personnel vehicles, that's IFVs, MRAPs, APCs, all these letters, all those types of, of vehicles, that is a heavy loss. So thirty of each of you know those combined is going to hurt the Russians. And I can tell you, I have seen an absolute bucket load of imagery and videos to suggest that these figures are at least somewhat correct. I mean, I show you a few bits and pieces. I mean, it's arbitrarily chosen, uh, but th there is a lot of equipment being destroyed. A lot of first-person view drone activity. In fact, I'll, I'll show you a quote. Uh, soon from a Russian source saying the skies are black with drones. Uh, and this is, I think, where you're starting to see army of drones raising $350 million or whatever and providing lit, you know, 10,000 drone operators, trained drone operators and drones and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I think you're starting to see that materialize in a, in a significant way uh, on the front line for the Ukrainians, right? 18 artillery systems is another bad day for the Russians. Uh, two multiple launch rocket systems is also useful, as well as two anti aircraft warfare systems. Both those categories have, well, MLRS works out as just over one a day, uh, anti aircraft warfare systems less than one a day uh, over the course of the war as an average. Two a day for both of those is a good day. Depends how. Uh, what what those systems are, how high value they are, particularly for anti-aircraft warfare systems. Right, 11 drones, two cruise missiles. That's going to be from the night before as opposed to last night, I think. 33 vehicles and fuel tanks is a huge number. And again, this is affecting how the Russians are able to or not able to get not just supplies to the front line. Uh, you're talking ammunition, you're talking food, you're talking water. Uh, so on and so forth, but actually troops to the front line. I wonder whether it's just difficult to get people around places because they have lost so many vehicles. They are starting to use a lot of civilian vehicles, I think precisely because they are running low on uh, military vehicles or they see them as a bigger target. I don't know. Special pieces of... Two pieces of special equipment have also been lost. That could be, as I always say, excavators. It could be ISR... Uh, that's intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, electronic warfare, whatever. Uh, that's a wide category um, there. So uh, that is another good day for the Ukrainians. However, don't forget that the Ukrainians are attacking at the moment and they are losing significant pieces of kit. In fact, I was watching Andrew Perpetua's live stream last night and I swing, as you know, I swing from high to deep, extremes of sweet and sour. Uh, just to quote my favourite band. Um, the I, on the one hand, you're thinking, right, the Ukrainian counteroffensive is possibly in full swing and you feel quite buoyed up because, you, you know, you are singing the praises of, of the hits and maybe ignoring the misses. Uh, never ignore the misses. 
she gets annoyed. Uh, so um, I think here we must be careful to also recognise that Ukrainians will be taking large losses. And uh, Andrew Perpetua is saying his big worry is, and there was a lot of not quite doom and gloom on his, but just on his live stream, just a bit of realism, which is that um, the Ukrainians are losing a lot of troops as well in places like the Robotna sector and Velikanova Silka they have done. It's a bit of an operational pause now in Velikanova Silka to refit and, and go again. But the Ukrainians are losing, will have lost uh, quite a large number of troops. And actually, that's the thing that they would, f they will find most difficult to replace. Those human beings that, that the Russians can mobilize uh, by force in Russia and are doing so. And they're getting so crypto mobilization of, you know, illegal migrants and legal migrant workers. Uh, just yeah, rounding them up, you're going to war. Ukrainians, that's a lot harder to do, right? And and they are relying a lot on volunteers at the moment, people who are who are, you know, deciding to go to the front line themselves. Well, there's only so many people that will be happy to put their life on the line, even for something as important as the existential future of their country. So that is that is a challenge for the Ukrainians. And it, they can't just keep uh, plugging those those holes with like fresh you know troops it's not so easy and so i you know just be careful i think it's a massive front line and they there are so many robust defenses that i think it is kind of touch and go for the for the ukrainians possibly um although you know they do have the support of the west but the west can't change some of the issues within the ukrainian uh, military infrastructure yes they can provide you know leopard 2 tanks and yeah, F-16s and possibly too late um, uh, or or later than, than would have been ideal. But some of the issues that the Ukrainian uh, army and project, military project is facing are issues that the Ukrainians have to sort out. And it, that's a lot more difficult. It's more sort of endemic. Anyway, yeah, the, sometimes I need to catch my positivity and optimism with a dollop of realism and do you know what? This is going to be hard and it is touch and go. And the Ukrainians are losing troops and equipment as well. Um, right. This is Andrew Perpetua, the mapper that I was just referring to as he to as he get surveys the uh, video footage and imagery uh, to find out exactly what's going on along the front line. He tots up what has been lost. And as you can see, the Russians are losing huge amounts of equipment. There's no doubt about that. So going back to what the general staff say, it's pretty much supported by what the evidence is. But the Ukrainians are losing a lot too, right? Don't don't forget that. And that will include troops in there as well. The, the other guy on Andrew Perpetua's live stream was taking, the, and he's a former soldier, was taking a more optimistic approach where he was like, yeah, as long as... The, so don't don't just concentrate on how what Ukraine are losing also concentrate on what Russia are losing. And if those ratios are still really beneficial, then it's pretty hopeful for Ukraine. So that that is you know, where we're at. And you look at these figures and you're thinking, right, that's a lot of ISR stuff, uh, boats, artillery, tanks, IFEs, APCs, trucks, civilian vehicles, so like the whole gamut there. It, Russia is losing a lot of stuff. And that is, you know, good for... Good for the Ukrainians. You know, you've got a couple of multiple launch rocket systems there. A Yugan and a Grad, um, and you know, FPV drones are having an effect on what is being lost here too. Now, the Ukrainians, uh, you've got a tractor, you've got um, some artillery, a little bit of artillery, a little bit of everything there. It's not you know hugely problematic when you look at the IFVs. They are all BMP ones, apart from the last one being a Bradley lost to an ATGM. The question is, when you uh, hit Russian, um, when you hit Russian defenses and logistics as hard as the Ukrainians are, then how many ATGMs do they have? So it, you know, it's it's understanding not only the losses for the Ukrainians, but going forward. You know, again, it's the kind of ratios and the capability the Russians have or don't have. Do they have the ability in their second line of defense 
to hammer the the Ukrainians with mines? Do they have densely set minefields? Do they have ATGMs uh, to hand to blow up the the the, the stuff that that's, that the Ukrainians are using? That's an open question at the moment, but it it might be that that they had a lot more of that kind of stuff in the early part of the counteroffensive, and that's why the Ukrainians lost a lot. But going forward, it might it might favour the Ukrainians. Um, right. Bad news for the Ukrainians yesterday as well. So just to add a bit more to the uh, the doom and gloom uh, of realism here, uh, Ukrainians lost two MiG twenty nines yesterday in a, in a mid air collision back in Jitomir. That is obviously terrible, but it's terrible as well because one of the pilots was Juice, who is uh, a bit of a hero and has been on social media quite a bit. Juice was a patriot to the bitter end. We had many talks about the war and how desperately Ukraine needed F-16s. He fought as a pilot to the bitter end. May his soul rest in peace. Heroes never die. He made his last flight yesterday. So that is an absolute clangor for the Ukrainians there to, to lose two planes, especially, you know, but apparently by mistake, you know, a collision as opposed to being shot down on the front lines. That's more unlikely for Ukrainian fighters because I don't think they just get close enough to the front lines for that to happen. So this kind of loss will absolutely smart. It's, it's terrible news for the for the Ukrainians that. On the other hand, a Su-25 was shot down at front line, a Russian Su-25. This footage is just coming out, a low-quality video, but we can see it 15 seconds that the Ukrainians hit and at 20 seconds shot down uh, a Russian Su-25. That will be a big loss for the Russians. Um, so yeah, All right. Moving on. I, um, David D who's an American soldier who, who comments a lot on Ukraine war. Don't quite know what this refers to exactly. He says today's attack, and I need to look into what this attack was and how it was done on the 126th brigade of the black sea fleet of the Russians Federation is a joint special operation of military counterintelligence of the SBU and ZSU. Uh, the drones successfully worked against the occupiers. Our exact number is not mentioned, but it is noted that it was a group of drones. Currently, we can definitely talk about several dozen Russians killed and wounded. Ammunition and equipment storage facilities were also damaged. Sources of the SBU predict even more surprises for the occupiers in the future. I don't know where this was. It might be an attack in Crimea on on a base, on something with drones. I don't know. But, you know, it's, it's a loss of troops that then leads towards the figures we've been seeing. Now, here is a US supplied, supplied striker that we saw, was it a marder that got stuck in a trench? This happens. And it's, it's, it's really unfortunate, but it's surprisingly easy to do. These trenches aren't massive. So as you're driving with a very small aperture in your vehicle, maybe, these things are not easy to see, right? Uh, they are overgrown from both sides. So you can easily drive uh, across a trench or, or not, in, as the case may be, because you just didn't know it was there. And this striker has now been, uh, is now stuck and abandoned whether it's it's recoverable for the Ukrainians. I don't I was trying to work out what troops these guys were, whether they were Russians or Ukrainians, and you can't actually tell. But judging by their kit, could be Ukrainians. So it could be recoverable. I don't, I'm just not 100% sure. Right. Uh, many destroyed Russian tanks, BMPs and trucks near Bakhmut. Uh, Russia's counterattacks around Bakhmut ended in total military disaster. This is just a bit of a, a montage of, of a graveyard of equipment. that has... I knew that was going to happen. Do you know when you press a button and you're like, don't do that. Don't. Oh, you've done it. Yeah, idiot. Uh, yeah, it's just a lot of stuff uh, that has been lost. Uh, the question is, is that lost at a ratio that is beneficial to the Ukrainians as ever? Uh, and just another, again, it's an arbitrarily picked bit of footage that supports, you know, tanks are, that tanks are being lost still. This is in Marienka. Just a Russian tank has hit a mine. This is geolocated. And I'm going to check on the map for, at the front line bit as to where this is in Marienka. I'd be interested to see you know, where a Russian tank is hitting a mine, whether it's behind their own lines and just comes across a mine that's, that's I don't know, could have been launched as a ram, as a, as a kind of artillery shell that lets out these submunition mines, or whether this is you know, in, an indication where the front line is. Uh, but anyway, a Russian tank has hit a mine and it's a uh, big bang. Um, so that is that. Uh, then 
Um, we have, yeah, just lots of vid videos here. You've got to be careful. So Visegrad 24, one of those sources, you've got to take the pinch of salt sometimes. Uh, here, Ukrainian artillery annihilating a fleeing Russian column of tanks and armored vehicles. This is the same footage. The Russians are good at doing this. It's whether this is done on purpose or not. Uh, and I don't think it is. I think this is someone that sees this and thinks it's fleeing because it kind of does look like it. It's also sped up. So it looks like they're absolutely hammering it, trying to get out of there. Oh, my goodness. <sighs> Two in a day. Uh, so it is sped up. So there's lots of equipment. But actually, this is from the other direction. And this is that attack on uh, on Bakhmut, on just north of Klyshchivka, where there, this was not fleeing Russians. This was an attack of Russians that were then hammered by artillery. And you had a massive loss of equipment. But it's just it's from a th it's a third drone. And what what's interesting about this is not not only that you know you can go oh it's just the same footage from a different angle, the same event from a different angle, uh, and that's true. And this is the third angle of this we've seen. And it, they aren't fleeing tanks; they're attacking tanks. Anyway, and and it's some days old now. But David D is quite right. So this tells me something. This is a third video I've seen of the same battle slaughter from three different ways. How effing many drones were over this? And this goes back to the airs of black with drones. Like there are drones everywhere, and here you've got a, a a battle that's taking place. The Russians are right. We're going to attack. This is hardcore. We're having a big battle. We're trying to take it by surprise. Three Ukrainian drones up there taking pictures of it all, going, "Yeah, that's nice." Guys, bit to left, bit to right, bang, bang, bang. There you go. Knocked all of them out. Drones. Drones. It's, drones are so important. They are where this war is going, you know, in a big way. The evolution of drone usage is fascinating. There will be books written on this. Uh, good evening, Kakovka. So in terms of strikes, not quite strikes. These are not distant strikes as I'll cover in the next section, but this is artillery active uh, one would assume, as opposed to High Mars, but it seems to be a strike on in Kalkovka, near the Dnipro River, on what looks like some kind of ammunition dump or something. There's also an ammo depot exploding near Oleshki, so the Ukrainians are hammering uh, the left bank uh, and taking out, um, obviously, important targets. Russia, another construction supply store destroyed near Nak uh, Nakabino. So this is a Moscow suburb, and this is Russia on fire again. Now, this is not, you know, some people are like, why Why do you just keep showing stuff of Russia being on fire? It's not It's not really important. It's, it's what you would expect in a normal country. Actually, the, I've done a couple of statistical analyses of this to show that actually this is well over and above what would normally happen. Here's another one, large fire near Moscow tonight. I don't know if this is the same fire from a different angle. It was to be expected since today is the end of, uh, it's a day in the week ending in day. It appears that the construction market is now all but ashes. So construction, construction supply store. So I'd say that's the same thing, right? Now, Russia's FSB is claiming that Ukraine's special services are behind a big increase in arson attacks. So this is one, Russia admitting there's a big increase in arson attacks, and two, blaming the Ukrainians for it. Whether it is Ukrainians or whether it is Russians, uh, doing some partisan activities and showing their their displeasure at the war effort by doing stuff like this, I can't say. They specifically say the MOD, Ministry of Internal Affairs and Russian Railways Infrastructure, are targeted. So that is to say it's not just construction sites like that. It's MOD places like um, commissariats and recruitment offices, Ministry of Internal Affairs, uh, yeah, other, other governments, uh, buildings and infrastructure and Russian railways. Railways is a, a, com a, is a source of targets commonly hit. Right, moving on to more distant strikes now. Explosions were heard in the area of temporarily occupied Tokamak in the Zaporizhia region. Uh, lots of explosions. That talks to me of High Mars. Uh, interestingly, oh, have I got it here? It's a rebar. Uh, da, 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 da. I'll just go and find that. Hang on, two ticks. I had this in the military aid section, but I'm going to put it here. So this is Rebar, pro-Russian source, saying, moreover, we are told that a new shipment of Storm Shadow and Scalp missiles has arrived at the airfield in Starokostantiniv. So this is where they take off from with the Su-24M uh, bombers to 
uh, released the cruise missiles, and it's the place that's been targeted by the Russians a lot. We stopped hearing about them in the media because their usage was paused due to a lack of the missiles. Now they are replenished. Right. I ha I was talking to you how I haven't seen much use of, of uh, storm shadows recently, and I was wondering whether any of the planes have been hit in those attacks on the air airfield, or whether supplies of the missiles have been hit. We just don't know. Might well have happened. Well, Rebar here is saying not so much that, but saying that, 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 and it could be as a result of that, but the Ukrainians have run out of Storm Shadows and Scalps. And we have heard uh, somewhat that, that the Ukrainians have released, uh, have received some more scalps, I think, from um, from France, actually could also be Storm Shadows, as is mentioned here. So this is significant, and that does fit with my anecdotal analysis of what's going on and i think it's also uh really good news for the ukrainians because they need these cruise missiles big time over the past few days they also say three or four su-27s have been flying in the skies over zaporizhia equipped with harm anti-radiation mi missiles their job is to hit as many air defense uh, assets as possible okay going back mariupol has been hit russian air defense is reportedly active uh what else crimea has been consistently struck uh russian positions there so you know some claims about um attack coastal defense in the occupied temporarily occupied crimea is active not the first attack oh this is 126 separate mountain uh, assault brigade uh there was an attack so that could be what david d was talking about earlier that that led to several dozens of dead and injured russian soldiers so that is that it appears to be a drone attack then uh, a photo from Crimea reportedly showing the attack on a Russian military base in per Perevelny, southeast of Simferopol. And actually, that is exactly where that, that looks like it is. Um, uh, I guess that's what that place is. So that could be the attack on the 126th there, uh, ending up looking like that. Uh, mass drone attack by Ukraine. So that was the 42 drones that attacked Ukraine the other night that the Russians said they shot down nine of them and 33 of them were taken out by electronic warfare. Well, don't know if that's true. Um, Ukrainian S-200, they are using these quite a lot at the moment. So they are hitting uh, positions just to the north of Crimea, logistics being hit. Russians are saying at least two rockets hit, deep strikes into Russian supply areas. Uh, drones are hitting Moscow last night, and uh, for another night, Ukrainian drones hit Moscow. Moscow airports are taking advanced security measures, so they're getting closed down again. And actually, that is significant. The Russian uh, you know, commercial... Uh, infrastructure is being hit but also or at least affected but also the russian public will know about this right delays to planes you know people know about that and they all know why that's happening right uh here as well um zaporizhia was hit possibly there could have been a missile that got through air defense last night into zaporizhia so the russians may well have hit zaporizhia and kherson the right bank is also being shelled uh, quite a lot by the the Russians. So there's quite a bit of activity for the Russians there. Right. Last segment here, we have uh, other bits and pieces. Just to let you know that, you know, question is, is, hey, Russian voices, as I always like to ask pro-Russian uh, trolls, um, you know, are you guys on the right side? Is this what happens in your country? Uh, into a country of liberty. Uh, Igor Gherkin, arrested. Sergei Surovikin, dismissed. Andre Yudin, dismissed or detained. Vladimir Alexei, dismissed or detained. Zakhar Prilepin, car bombed. Daria Dugina, dead. Vladen Tatarsky, dead. Yevgeny Prigozhin, dead. Dmitry Utkin, dead. Alexei Navalny, in prison and poisoned. So on, you know, it, it goes on, it goes on. But these are, you know, your uh, Navalny isn't, but these are your ultra nationalists and hardliners. These are people who are essentially really in support of Russia doing well. I think this is, signifies that things aren't aren't going so well for the Russians. Russian near Nazi unit Rusish uh, has announced that it is suspending its participation in the war in Ukraine. The group says that the Russian authorities are not providing assistance to their leader, who is detained in Finland. So what's happened here? So another high... Uh, no, this is... Sorry, I will come back to that. I just want to go to Finland. So news emerges in Finland that they have jailed a soldier who is alleged to be one of the leaders of the neo-Nazi military group, DSRG Rusish. Uh, in fact, Jan Petrovsky was detained a month ago when crossing the border, and Russian telegram channels are angry. He's not been visited once by 
embassy staff. Petrovsky was originally held in a migrant center before being charged. Ukraine is thought to have requested his extradition for fighting in a 2014 illegal invasion of Donbass. Petrovsky in, at one time had residency permit in Norway. Um, so yeah, there you go. That is uh, that that is causing quite a bit of a stir. This caused quite a stir yesterday, uh, but it might also be incorrect. So here's a Wagner fighter that's gone to a um, a an obelisk, a memorialising Wagner losses. This is a Wagner cemetery, and he's seen, saying, "Hang on, why have all the graves?" graves being knocked down and cemented over why are all the the crosses for the graves all piled up you know what are you doing are you not afraid of god so he's like look at all of this and he's saying that the wagner cemetery has just been like erased if you like uh all these little crosses for all the dead guys but then the comeback to that is actually no they're cementing over it because they're going to make it a proper cemetery and, and like blah 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 but then you're like you wouldn't take the crosses away and just dump them in a pile and not know where those crosses go. Like, so there are, there are claims and counterclaims here. There are claims that he's got it completely wrong and that they, they are just making the cemetery a better cemetery and a nicer place. But then it's kind of weird if you've literally got dead bodies under there and you've kind of cemented over them or whatever. So anyway, that that's caused a, a lot of um, fracas on the internet. Um, and then a few bits from Tim White as well, just to kind of finish up today. Um, we have here it is so uh high profile sacking in ukraine so he crook uh, has been fired as head of state of the emergency services the they only say it follows an internal review so i don't know why that is but crook's deputy now takes over uh so there's a lot of this and you can say on the one hand oh that's a bit troublesome uh, troubling uh but on the other hand actually you know strong robust activity is taken when people aren't doing their jobs correctly or there's corruption or whatever and and they got rid of them and you know that's good child sweatshop labor appears to be alive and well in europe look how happy the kids are uh uh, uh look at them here <laughs> really unhappy looking in krasnoyarsk five children spent their school holidays sewing two tons of clothes for russia's military there's a worrying new law on compulsory labor education in schools they they don't really look well. They look a bit happier there, but yeah, child labour. Hey, hey, Russia, how's it going? Um, anyway, that's the end of part one. I'll get part two to you in many hours' time, several hours' time. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Please take care. Like, subscribe, like, subscribe, share. Blah blah blah. Later.